Thank you very much. Um, so this is quite a large topic, so I thought um, we would focus on talking a little bit about liver dysfunction in the ICU, um, some <coughs> consensus definition on acute on chronic liver failure, because there's been a lot of controversy about that, and then some specific complications, including sepsis and infection, um, acute variceal hemorrhage, and a renal failure, and then complete with um, a discussion about um, novel liver support systems. So liver dysfunction in the ITU. Um, so when we look at liver dysfunction in the ITU and the patients, um, early cholestatic dysfunction is seen in about um, uh, sort of 10 to 20% uh, of patients. Hypoxic liver injury, less so, 5 to 10% of patients. Acute and chronic liver failure, more than sort of 3 to 7%. But when we talk about acute liver failure, it's re re relatively rare with two to 10 cases per million per, pe per persons per annum. So when we talk about acute liver failure, it's rarely seen in general ICUs. Um, I, I work in a cancer ITU, so what we see a lot of is liver dysfunction as a result of chemotherapy. And so we are often faced with patients who've had multiple rounds of chemotherapy, and these are some of the drugs that commonly cause liver dysfunction in the ICUs. And particularly the novel agents um, are interesting because there's a lot of advances in Im immunotherapies now, um, really making changes to <coughs> melanoma treatment. And we're seeing lots of side effects of the immunotherapies, and one of this is um, hepatotoxicity. And so um, these immunotherapies um, cause immune-related side effects in 80% of patients, and with hepatitis, enterocolitis, endocrinopathies, and dermatitis, and neuropathies and about a quarter of patients get severe reactions. Um, so often they're admitted to the ITU and we're having to manage them. So how do we manage some of these sort of um, immunotherapy-related um, adverse effects? Um, so, and the interesting thing is the development of adverse effects is not related to um, anti, is, is associated with anti-tumor response, and you can get a delayed response, often sort of six weeks after being given immunotherapies. Um, and the key stone is obviously supportive care, but steroids, and um, we often give steroids, high-dose steroids for these patients. And if that doesn't work, um, and if they have severe he hepatitis, severe colitis, then we end up giving them infliximib infusions um, for steroid refractory cases. And it takes about four days to a week um, before we see a response. So just because it's an area of my interest and I work in a cancer ICU, I thought it'd be interesting just to explain about the hepatic um, effects of cancer agents. Um, but going back to acute and chronic liver failure, there's been um, a new consensus definition um, published in The Lancet in 2015. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about this definition, but in acute and chronic liver failure, it's now defined as a syndrome in patients with chronic disease um, with or without cirrhosis, characterized by acute hepatic decompensation, resulting in liver failure and extra hepatic um, organ failures associated with increased mortality, anything from 28 days to three months. And they've seen it now as a spectrum of disease rather than a single entity with type A, where you have non-cirrhotic acute on chronic liver failure, B, where you have cirrhotic with he hepatic deterioration, and type C disease, where you have multiple episodes of cirrhotic decompensation. So they've like redefined the def um, acute and chronic on chronic liver failure. So what are the precipitants of acute on chronic liver failure? Well, in 40% of cases, there is no precipitant. By far the most common precipitant is sepsis, um, where over 50%, but one needs to think about drugs, um, a lot of the drugs that we give, um, viral reactivation, um, ischemic hit from sepsis, um, and other, um, and surgery commonly. Um, so sepsis and infection, and the infection is the most common initiated event in acute on chronic liver failure, and we know that um, patients, particularly with um, liver failure, are uh, at high risk of infection because of impaired immune function, re reduced complement factor production, impaired neutrophil leukocyte monocyte function, and copper cell function. And it's also the interventions we do um, for the diagnosis, so putting in lines and biopsies that we take, which makes patients with liver failure at increased risk of vulnerability and to infection. 
Um, and septic shock in patients with acute on chronic liver failure. What we do know is that cirrhotic patients have a um, vascular hyperreactivity, um, and so they have a hyperdynamic circulation with high cardiac output and low SVR. They often suffer from cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. And there's a lot of controversy about the choice of initial fluid in so septic shock management in patients with acute on chronic liver failure. Um, and increasing evidence, perhaps, of use of role of albumin, early, early use of albumin. Um, there's also um, a lot of them, three quarters of cases um, have relative adrenal insufficiency. And similar to the cortica study, they saw a reduction when given steroids, they show a reduction in vasopressorgosis and early shock reversal, but increased complications such as GI bleed, but no impact on mortality. And this is in a subgroup of patients with um, acute and chronic liver disease. Um, and remember with the pathophysiology of patients with an um, infection um, with acute and chronic liver disease, it's not just a, um, a, a hyperreactive um, state and release of cytokines, but also an anti-apoptotic state where actually, um, the, which re leads to direct organ damage with liver um, dysfunction, with jaundice and coagulopathy, um, encephalopathy, adrenal insufficiency, and tra gut translocation. So it's not just an increase in pro-inflammatory response, but a failure of the anti-apoptotic response. Um, so outcomes and from septic shock is poor with hu huge mortality, um, anything from 60 to 100% mortality. And the stage of liver failure is closely associated with mortality. I think the keystone in treatment, with, as in any sepsis management, is source control, but it's not always obvious in patients um, with chronic liver disease, um, often who have normal CRPs or normal white cell counts because they don't have um, a good respo immune response. Um, early antibiotic therapy uh, should be guided by local advice. One needs to consider the high incidence of fungal infection in the subgroup of um, patients. And prophylaxis um, is supported in patients with encephalopathy, GI bleeds, and um, subacute bacterial peritonitis. And this is a sort of conference they had um, where they recommended, strongly recommended, prophylaxis in people having GI bleed or um, SBP um, with low protein ascites and secondary prophylaxis and SBP. So the next thing I'm going to move on to is acute variceal hemorrhage. Um, esophageal varices is common in this patient subgroup, um, but other causes of GI bleed need to be considered. We know that the peak rebleed day um, is day five, and one in four patients rebleed within the first six weeks. In 50% of cases, despite any treatment, giving no treatment, bleed stops spontaneously. But key to the management in principle is pharmacology and endoscopy. And the outcomes for these subgroup of patients is really improving. Um, what is important is hepatic um, venous pressure gradient. So if you have a greater than 20 millimeters um, of mercury, it's impro important in prognosis with higher um, associated treatment failures. Um, so this is just an algorithm um, of management of acute variceal bleed. So the keystone is um, immediate pharmacological management, first choice being terlopressin. Um, antibiotics, three to five days. Um, because in 66% of cases, it's complicated by infection. You have um, a high risk of infection, so 66% of patients get infection. And early endoscopy um, by an experienced endoscopist to confirm the diagnosis and then variceal ligation. Obviously, if you don't get managed get, to get control of bleed, it's about thinking about a second um, endoscopic ligation and then going on to um, rescue tips or um, surgical shunt. But also, the keystone is maintaining um, vasoactive therapy for a minimum of two to five days, and then thinking about secondary prophylaxis, including um, beta blockers in the longer term. Um, obviously, these patients often need intensive care support with experienced staff, um, and thinking about um, you know, uh, interim measurements if uh, bleeding is massive, including the use of balloon tamponade. Um, variceal hemorrhage, so some uh, thoughts in terms of practical aspects. Um, intubation, how, you know, how aggressively should we be thinking about intubating them? When patients with grade one encephalopathy, the risk of aspiration is about two to three percent. What hemodynamic targets should we be um, looking at? Um, so systolic blood pressure between 80 to 100, um, trying to get the heart rate down below 
um, 100. But remember, change in portal pressure. So if you're overfilling your patient, um, over transfusing your patients, or aggressively resuscitating patients, that impacts on your portal pressure and then increases your risk of rebleed. Um, so here is your balance between over transfusion, pushing your portal pressures up with increased bleeding and um, impact on your homeostasis and immunity versus under transfusion um, causing hypovolemic shock and t um, decreased tissue oxygenation. So it's really about getting that balance right. And what we do know is um, PT and INR are not reliable in patients with cirrhosis and certainly in our unit for this subgroup of patients we're increasing using um, TEG to guide our therapy. Um, what is key in the management is um, trilopressin, so that's first line in terms of pre-endoscopy, trilopressin, the recommendation um, it, to, to reduce portal pressure, but second line you can think about use of ultratide or somatostatin, um, which has a secondary effect in reducing your portal pressure. Uh, and antibiotics, so here's um, the studies um, showing good evidence that prophylactic antibiotics in patients with upper GI bleeding decreases bacterial infection and reduces mortality, particularly um, the use of keftrioxone, um, which is um, recommended for these patients. Um, endoscopic management, so for ligation of um, esophageal varices, but of course, if you fail endoscopic management, then thinking about tips for salvage therapy and surgery, including the use of portosystemic shunts. Um, and there is some uh, suggestion that, and this is a recently published paper um, in the last year, suggesting the benefit of using early tips. So um, you, disp um, even after using early tips within the first five days, um, reduces the risk of rebleed and um, in improves outcome. And so there is a re suggestion that maybe um, we should be offering these patients early tips without the increased risk of encephalopathy um, that we might have thought in the past. Um, so finally, um, talking a little bit about acute kidney injury in patients with cirrhosis. There's huge variations um, in the literature due to really differences in study populations, but also um, varying definitions. Um, so the quote, quoted anything between 15 to 50 percent of patients with um, cirrhosis have um, acute kidney injury. Now with acute kidney injury in patients with cirrhosis, the measurement of serine creatinine is inaccurate and that's because of muscle atrophy which re causes a re um, reduction in synthesis of um, creatinine, renal tubal secretion of creatinine and increased volume of distribution. Um, so serum creatinine in patients with cirrhosis often off overestimates um, GFR, and so it's not very helpful. Um, there's been also a revised consensus recommendation um, in the diagnos diagnosis of, um, and staging of acute kidney injury in patients with cirrhosis. Um, firstly, mainly because urine output is not very helpful in, in patients with um, cirrhosis. And also, finally, um, baseline creatinine of one week is usually not um, useful, and so they've agreed for a value baseline creatinine um, in the last three months. So stage one is defined by an increase um, by, of serine creatinine of 0.3 milligrams per deciliter, um, or 1.5-fold um, to two-fold from baseline. Stage two, um, two to three-fold, and stage three, if you have an increase in serum creatinine of more than threefold from baseline um, or initiation of renal replacement therapy. So this is the recommendation um, from the International Club of um, Ascites published um, in 2015. Um, etiology of acute kidney injury in patients with um, acute and chronic liver failure, most are pre-renal, um, but one needs to consider renal and post-renal causes. And the etiology is important. Um, because the etiology has prognostic significance. Um, and so when we look at, when they looked at patients with um, acute kidney injury and cirrhosis, majority due to infection, hypovolemia, um, and much less so due to um, parenchymal nephropathy. But what we do know is that the prognostic importance is different um, in patients with cirrhosis with much better outcomes in patients with 
parenchymal nephropathy and hypovolemia than hepatorenal um, syndrome. And so this is just a management algorithm in patients um, for, uh, with acute kidney injury um, with cirrhosis. So dividing them into pre-renal, intrarenal, and post-renal. Obviously, post-renal, um, uh, less than 1% of cases treating the underlying cause. Intrarenal, um, thinking about treatable causes, doing an early um, renal biopsy. And then pre-renal, just ma majority are volume responsive, but about 30% um, have a uh, uh, possible underlying diagnosis of hepatorenal syndrome, and which, in which case you need specific treatments such as albumin and vasoconstrictors and need to think about going on to um, as a bridge to liver transplant. So um, hepatorenal syndrome, this is the latest sort of diagnostic criteria. Um, so it's talking about um, patients with cirrhosis with ascites, serum creatinine greater than 1.5. You need to have an absence of shock. Um, no improvement of serum creatinine after two days of diuretic withdrawal or volume expansion with albumin. Um, and you have to exclude nephrotoxic drugs and parenchymal disease such as proteinuria or hematuria or abnormal renal ultrasonography to have the diag um, diagnosis. Remember there's two types. There's the type one and that's more aggressive with um, doubling of your serum creatinine. Um, and a much worse outcome, and type 2, which is more indolent, um, with a median survival of six months, and much more rapid, um, gradually progressive, as opposed to type 1. And if we think about the uh, pathophysiology behind it, remember you get the portal hypertension, the systemic and splanchnic vasodilatation, um, causing uranium angiotensin systems and vasoconstrict, um, vasoconstriction, uh, renal vasoconstriction, and um, therefore reduce um, blood flow to the kidneys together with cirrhotic cardiomyopathy um, resulting in the um, hepatorenal syndrome. Um, the keystone for most uh, management of acute kidney injury is avoiding nephrotoxic agents, um, diuretics. Often are the, these patients are on um, large doses of diuretics and in the initial instance, um, plasma volume expansion. Um, and particularly with hemo um, so hepatorenal syndrome, use of albumin, um, early use of vasoconstrictors, terlipressin, and then use of renal replacement therapy um, as a bridge to transplant. And this is um, evidence to support uh, the combination of terlipressin and albumin versus albumin owning, showing much more um, better response with a combination of terlipressin and albumin. <coughs> And a meta-analysis, once again, supporting um, in favor of the combination of terlipressin and albumin uh, versus albumin only showing resolution of hepatorenal syndrome and improved renal function. Um, and this is the most uh, recent study, the reverse study, looking at terlipressin versus placebo um, plus albumin um, showing benefit um, of terlipressin, once again, terlipressin and albumin um, with a combination in treatment. Um, so practical aspects, uh, recommendations, uh, you would uh, initially give a uh, dose of terlipressin, two to six milligrams per day in divided doses, and if you don't get an early response, you can double that every two days to a maximum of 12 milligrams. And if you don't see a drop in your serum creatinine um, after seven days of the highest dose, which is 12 milligrams per, um, per day, then um, it's unlikely that you will see a benefit by continuing treatment. And if you do see a benefit, then think about treatment for maximum 14 days. Um, and of, of course, there is the option of um, thinking about noradrenaline as an alternative to vasoterlipressin, um, and it shows kind of um, has shown that you could think in terms of reversal of hepatorenal syndrome um, equivalence, and in terms of um, adverse events. Uh, slightly less with um, nor epipherin compared to um, terlipressin. Um, so what about patients who fail a therapy? So thinking about renal replacement therapy as a bridge to transplants as a holding measure. Um, some units use um, extracorporeal albumin dialysis and uh, TIPS procedure, um, but remember they have a high risk of encephalopathy and failure. Um, and I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about renal replacement therapy in patients with cirrhosis. 
So really um, using renal replacement therapy as a bridge to transplant for hepatorenal syndrome, but also if you have an um, early reversible um, condition. Um, they do have a high risk of bleeding and hemodynamic complications, which is not su surprising. Um, and um, there is this controversy about, or, or previously, about regional citrate anticoagulation. But when we look at the studies of using citrate in patients with liver failure, actually, relatively, the risk of bleeding and citrate accumulation is relatively low when we look at um, the published studies um, to date. And um, when we, and this recent study, the LCAT study um, published in 2015, looked at, used, um, looked at using regional citrate anticoagulation in patients with um, liver failure, and they found in general that um, the recommendation is that you could be used in patients with liver failure, and certainly we do in, on our unit. And, um, you know, and actually they said it, they yielded um, excellent filter patency. Um, so you can consider a citrate anticholation despite the fact that you might think you might, it, it's not um, suitable for patients with liver failure. Um, finally, liver support systems. Well, there are a number of studies out there looking at artificial livers, whether it's albumin dialysis or plasma exchange. Um, there's been the MARS study, the relief for Prometheus study. Um, and then there's also these new bioartificial devices. The problem is none of them have failed to um, show any mortality benefit. They have, some of them have showed improved quality of life or reduced length of stay, but at present there's not enough evidence to show any um, longer term um, mortality benefit um, in these liver support systems. Um, so in summary, um, new de definition of acute on chronic liver failure, it's not a single entity but a spectrum of diseases. Um, and remember, common precipitants by far is infection, but in 40% of cases, no cause is identified. And patients, we didn't talk about encephalopathy because of time, but you know, we talked about acute kidney injury, GI bleed. And the disease can be reversed by, um, in many patients, but it's about close collaboration, working together with your hepatologist and your um, intensivist. And the benefits of artificial liver and bioartificial devices is yet to be determined at this stage. So I thank you very much for your time.